Some New York Times writers are asking management for more censorship at their own paper. You really can't make some of this stuff up, folks. It is a bar- bizarre yeah. turn of events, and here to break it all down is great friend of the show and journalist Zed Jelani. Zed, it's great to see you. Good to see you, Zed. Good to be here. So this all started with a Brett Stevens column, which looked at the 1619 Project, which some journalists, at least at the Times, objected to. Just break down for us kind of the trajectory of exactly what happened here. Yeah, so Brett Stevens is a columnist at New York Times, meaning he writes for the op-ed page. uh, He writes a regular column there. Uh, The 1619 Project was produced by the New York Times Magazine, which is kind of a sister publication, although within the same umbrella. Uh, basically what happened is Stevens kind of wrote his own critique of some of the analysis of history, some of the omissions, some of the changes that were made within the project without being 100% transparent or clear with the public about why these changes were made. Uh, and it, it seemed basically like a critique of some of something that his own publication kind of was doing. Uh, now, that is rare. Uh, generally speaking, if you read the New York Times op-ed page, you don't really see criticisms of New York Times Magazine reporting or analysis or commentary. Uh, but to my knowledge, it's not necessarily prohibited. I don't think that there's anything within Brent Stevens' contract that says he cannot uh, disagree with something that's in the New York Times. Uh, so what we saw after this was that uh, the New York Times, the Guild, which is their union, uh, basically it represents you know reporters and staff, uh, people outside of management, uh, basically put out a tweet saying something to the extent of, uh, this is a, an attack on a colleague. This is uh, coming after a colleague. Uh, you know, it's not acceptable, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's what kind of piqued Glenn's interest, uh, Glenn Greenwald, the intercept, uh, and that he kind of pointed out that this was a case of a union uh, going after a colleague rather than rather than actually making a demand to management on behalf of, you know, people within the bargaining unit or people within the workers' space. And I think this is part of a larger trend. Uh, I think with more and more media unions, you see them kind of policing their colleagues or, you know, treating it like a modern university campus in some ways rather than doing the traditional bargaining over wages, benefits, uh, so on and so forth. And I think that it, it's a kind of a white collar union trend uh, that's happening. I don't I don't I'm not trying to, like, say that this is representative of the broader labor movement. I don't think steelworkers are doing this. I don't it couldn't think be farther fast food, from the labor movement. Yeah. Fast food workers are doing this. But right. I think in a lot of these, I've seen it in multiple publications where their unions are kind of used, used to police people within the union rather than representing those people in the union against the management. And I think this is a trend that Glenn saw as well uh, at other publications, and that's why he wrote this piece. Yeah. It's bizarre. And Zed, the, so the next layer of the story is that original tweet from New York Times Guild, which faced so much pushback ultimately because, yeah, you're basically like attacking one of your colleagues. And it also had a bunch of like typos in it, which is just embarrassing <laughs> coming from the New York Times Guild. That got deleted. And they essentially apologized, and I think it was sort of like one rogue person who ran the account who put the tweet out. So now they've kind of walked back their position. But on Twitter, you still have a lot of liberals who are defending the attack on Brett Stevens. Let me be clear. Like, I'm no big fan of Brett Stevens here. He writes plenty of stuff that I find to be outrageous, wrong, et cetera. Um, And this particular piece, like, I'd have to go through to say even whether I agree with this particular one. But now you have this weird dynamic of, like, the organization itself has kind of walked back the claims, but you still have people on Twitter going to bat for them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's because, again, I think that there is this trend among some left of center people uh, to kind of turn their workplaces into kind of an administrative environment similar to a lot of like these elite boutique colleges where if you have some issue with a with a disagreement with a colleague or with a coworker, with a classmate, you go to some administrator, you file a report, you go to HR, you call their manager, basically. Um, it's funny that a, a group of people who seem to be so hostile to police seem to be acting like police, honestly, to me is what it feels like sometimes. Right. Uh, but I think that this wider culture is much larger than the New York Times kind of guild. And that's why I think why you see a lot of people defending this approach. Now, I think a better approach to this would have been uh, for the New York Times to have more open and honest and transparent debates amongst itself. I think that, you know, it would have been nice if the New York Times held a forum on 1619 Project where alternative views were proposed and processed. And maybe Nicole Hannah-Jones would debate with someone like Brett Stevens in a kind of, you know, Oxford-style debate or some kind of formal format with a moderator. Uh, I think all those options should be explored long before you actually use an institution 
uh, that's supposed to be representing all staff uh, to, to deal with, with kind of rogue employee. And I kind of don't buy that. I don't buy the idea that like this tweet may have just been one person. My, I think a better explanation is probably that they got a lot of blowback for it. Uh, so they realized that it kind of was a bad look to be doing this with Brett Stevens, but it's probably representative of a larger culture of what's happening within the publication. Right. And I think just to illustrate how ridiculous it all is, Zed, I mean, we covered here on the show, I think it was last week, where the Times published an op-ed from a Hong Kong official affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party, who the thesis of the op-ed was Hong Kong is China, whether you like it or not. And that means the Chinese government has the right to crack down you know, kill and imprison many democracy protesters. And somebody pointed out, I think it was Josh Barrow, that there are literally New York Times reporters in Hong Kong. And one of the things that was objected to, the Tom Cotton op-ed, the line that they took was that this makes black staffers at the New York Times in danger. So in this case, you have a, a person that was published in the Times which is literally justifying a crackdown on their own colleagues and not one word from the New York Times Guild about any of this. Yeah, well, I think there's a sort of parochial nature to a lot of this. So, for instance, I think the reason that Tom Cotton up had raised so much fear it was because it was seen as an issue that was that the staff were deeply immersed in. Like this was where their attention was focused. George Floyd, police protests, riots, so on and so forth. Uh, Hong Kong is not a parochial issue for a lot of these people. I think the people who are in the New York Times Bureau in China and Hong Kong probably had very little relationship to like the Brooklyn based staffers uh, who run a lot of the politics of the New York Times. And I think they just, there's just so much social distance between themselves and and the people over there to where they didn't take this personally. Uh, personally, I don't have a problem with them publishing that. They did also publish another op-ed, which was uh, opposing it, offering right. the view that on, right. there's more autonomy. But it does show that there is kind of a double standard here. There's a certain set of boutique issues where they feel very personally invested in where they will apply a different standard than one where they don't feel as much personal investment. I mean, it's the same way many of these American firms uh, are doing business with China, but uh, put out, you know, racial justice messaging here in the United States, but they are happy to do business with a country that is involved in, you know, ethnic cleansing, you know, probably the worst ethnic cleansing that's happening in the world right now. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's, an, it's an unfortunate fact of just how sometimes we're inward looking as Americans. I think we don't, What's right in front of us or in our Twitter timeline, we see it. But if it's happening somewhere else, we kind of just ignore it. So, right. And Zed, what would you say to people who are like, why are you guys making such a This is like one tweet, it's one little incident. Like, who really cares? What would you say to those folks? Why does this matter? Well, I'm for, you know, I think Wesley Yang, who's a writer at Tablet, he said something like there's these huge changes happening in media, but they're not really being reported because they're happening in media, right? Like, we've, I've seen over the past few years a, a huge change in media culture to where it's just much more common for staff to police each other, to kind of coerce each other about their point of view. Uh, this is happening all across New York media, D.C. media. I, I, I know some, I know endless stories about this. Uh, and 10 years ago, it wasn't this way. And I think this tweet is emblematic of that culture. So I think it was worth people to push back on this. It wasn't, you know, we're not saying anybody should be fired. We're not saying anything like that. But it is worth at least saying this is inappropriate and that we shouldn't be doing this because it can have a chilling effect, right? Uh, it could be that the next New York Times columnist doesn't want to de uh, depart from their colleagues on any matter or issue because they don't want to be publicly shamed. They don't want right. uh, to have a union complaint made against them like James Bennett was, for instance. Uh, and, you know, Barry Weiss left the New York Times altogether due to things like this. So I think, you know, we it is worth pushing back on. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but it is at least it's something that should draw our attention because it is a cultural change in the institutions to help us see the entire world. I mean, media is how we how we're informed about things, whether it's happening in New York City or in Hong Kong. So it's yeah. important at least to keep an eye on that. Excellent I think that's point. well said. And it's just so bizarre to see a union calling the manager <laughs> one of the workers <laughs> like, what's going on here? Zed, thank you. Great to see Thanks, you. Zed. Thank you. Next on Rising, author Ryan Gerdusky is going to discuss what he thinks Republicans could make a comeback on Election Day if they follow a certain path. That's when Rising continues. <laughs> 